He is an Oscar winner, a brilliant and accomplished sound designer, a musician, and most importantly, a really, really good guy. We like to welcome to the place our friend, our new friend, but fast and enduring friend, Mark Mangini. Hey, bro. Mark. Pleasure. How are you, man? Good, good to man, see I've you. I've been wanting to meet Mark. Hey, man, so I reach long. across. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's all right. Sorry. That's cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh -huh. concept. Give us, what does a sound design person do on a film? What's the, d define it for us. A sound designer is responsible for everything that you hear, except for the music. Oh, literally. So everything but music is yeah. under your purview. So quickly, dialogue, sound effects, yeah. atmospheric sounds, yeah. foley, you know, those inciden wow. incidental sounds like footsteps yeah. and things like that. Um, and creation of the sounds of things that no one's ever heard before. So, so when the process happens, are you doing this by committee? Are you trusted to go your own way? You obviously have a script to work from, and it has to be germane to the picture, correct? Right. What is the decision-making process? Are you left alone? Is it different per film? It, of course, as, 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 you can, as, as in any creative endeavor, it depends on the, the nature of the person you're working with. Yeah. Every director is going to be different. Some are very hands-off, mm -hmm. some are micromanagers, mm -hmm. and everything else in between. Mm -hmm. Um, but think of what I do, maybe, maybe a, another analogy in the film world mm -hmm. is everyone knows what the cinematographer is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The cinematographer is responsible visually for everything that you see. That cinematographer helps direct the costume designer, the production designer, everything that, you might, that might be put in front of the camera to record visually. Mm -hmm. So too am I responsible for everything that you would hear sonically and sometimes that even includes working with the composer and being a part of oh, the music decision-making sure. process. Not the writing of the music, sure. but maybe this is where we need score. Maybe we don't want score here. Mm -hmm. So the director would turn to me to help him real or her realize their vision mm -hmm. sonically. Because the, those two things have to integrate sometimes, the, the music and what you're doing. Indeed. Oftentimes. They, they, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, yeah, that makes Something sense. Something I found mm -hmm. fascinating was you said that no sound is accidental in a movie. Right. There's nothing that can elude you. There's nothing that's going to escape you. If no, it's there, no. it's Every sound is considered. And it's the, you hear it, and you hear it at its level and placement and equalization and all mm -hmm. that other technical stuff. I didn't know that. For, for a reason. There's a reason for everything. For everything. And, and you said you, we, said you, also, have, you also have to make us... I'm excited about this. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> but, you, but you also have to make it as if the viewer thinks that you had a microphone in front of the camera while the camera was going, but none of that's true. It's all no. added. Well, sometimes, you know, in, in what we like to affectionately call a talkie, mm -hmm. a movie that isn't heavily reliant on sound or post sound, yep. often the microphone that was there on the set or location did capture most of everything. Mm -hmm. okay. But in the kinds of movies that I like to work on, like Mad Max, oh and I think God. we're going to talk a little bit sure. about it. That film had to be built from the ground up with almost no sound captured through no fault of the individuals who did record that mm -hmm, sound, mm -hmm. but it, it was, it was, it was um, out of their control sure. in terms of what they could capture sure. because there's wind machines and you know, just all sorts of sound polluting that recording that wouldn't make it a, a pristine recording to use in the studio. So uh, speaking of that movie, which... <clears throat> the tapestry of that in terms of sound just so rich and so deep so when you when I hear you talk about everything is under consideration how far in advance do you start thinking about this stuff is it as soon as you get the script is yeah it, and does yeah. it change for some are you under the gun sometimes do you have time to really build it out how do you do something that is just that complex there, there is literally no pro forma for that yeah. every movie is different on Mad Max we had a total of two and a half years, which is a, a complete anomaly. Wow. wow. The average studio film right. um, is around 16 right. weeks yeah, of post-sound, you right. know, sound design, editorial, mix, right. mastering. Right. That's, a pr that's an average, but George Miller is a nut for sound, and mm -hmm. he put his money where his mouth was Boy, and it paid pay for off. it. And, and it Thanks. paid off. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah thank you. Because you. That's a, that is such a, you know, I'm a movie buff. And that's such a, all the, all the competitive stuff in an Oscar is really, like the, the art is just really high.
It's at a high level. It is a super high level. But you know, now to answer your uh, previous question, mm -hmm. sometimes I'm on as early as the screenwriting phase. Really? I have a couple of directors that I work with that really recognize that sound is a storytelling tool. Mm -hmm. Very few filmmakers really get that mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. And they will call me and say, I'm working on a scene. This is the vibe of the scene. This is the feel. This is the emotional mm -hmm. curve of that scene. How does sound figure into this? Mm -hmm. And he'll allow me to contribute, and he might write the scene differently based on what I have to say about how sound is going to affect what the characters are thinking or experiencing. I was just going to ask you that because it, it has to lend itself to the directorial side and what the actor is doing and responding to sure. and because all of that is the tableau that gives you a reaction if you're somebody watching the film. Well, to give you an idea, um, I've worked on a couple of films. The one that comes to mind quickly is the first Star Trek film I worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, Leonard Nimoy is the director and there was a very pivotal sound that would recur throughout the film. It's the sort of mechanical protagonist mm -hmm. in the film. Mm -hmm. And he wanted, he, I had to design that sound ahead of time so that during filming, during production, we're not in post yet, right. he wanted to play that sound over speakers and capture the reaction, the reaction of the actors as they heard this sound mm -hmm. as if they were hearing it on the bridge of the Enterprise mm -hmm. for the very first mm -hmm. time. And that's a genuine, he wanted to elicit that genuine mm -hmm. visual reaction. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that, that's that's something you might do. Love Doesn't happen stuff. very often. Do you focus on on sounds that exist in nature, or do you focus on sounds that are synthesized? What's your approach? Like all over the board, right? I will always gravitate towards acoustically recorded sound, found sound, captured sound, okay. and I have a. I'm constantly recording. I live my life recording sound, mm. um, and there's couple of reasons for that. The first is this pet theory that I have that I can't prove but I, I genuinely believe mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. and that is psychoacoustically recorded sound sends a, a subconscious message to the brain that 100%, it's real. 100%. Our brain is interpreting subconsciously 100%. when we listen. Mm. And we do this 24 hours a day even mm -hmm. when we're asleep. Mm -hmm. So if I can even, if I can create the sound of something that doesn't exist science fiction film, a mm -hmm. spaceship, a creature, a mm -hmm. weapon, out of something that you think you've kind of heard before, but I've massaged it. Mm -hmm. I'm 50% of the way to convincing the audience, oh yeah, I, that's real. That's I buy that brilliant. thing. That really happened. That is really brilliant. I and completely the, get that. The second reason is that electronic sound, A, doesn't have that right. going for it, and B, I get lost in technology easily, mm -hmm. and I get an inspiration for a sound. I don't want to be monkeying with knobs in, right. in, a, in a, you know, a virtual synthesizer right. and, be, and it never sounds real to me. So I, I really eschew those things mm -hmm. except for what they do really well, okay. which is science fiction kinds right, of sounds. Exactly. If you're on the bridge of the Enterprise, you need a beep for when Sulu presses the button. That's right. That's probably a synthesizer yeah, sound. Absolutely. Although I love to cheat those sounds and I'll make them out of birds and monkeys. And really, oh, I, I, I still that. like to just, just get away from all of it and, and right. cheat the stuff. So do sample, oh I'm sorry. And so, oh, let me give you a little We're so excited. Yeah, no, Here, here's a good inside one for the audience. Oh, the sound from I, the classic. I cut you up then he cut you up. Yeah, it was beautiful. We had, a, a, beautiful we had a group cut off. We did. <laughs> um, the sound of the, of the communicator in the Star Trek TV, yeah. TV series yeah. is an owl chirp. Straight out of the Paramount Sound Effects Library. You're kidding that me. You know that? No joke. Not even electronic. I was going to ask you if sound libraries are important to you. Do you just have everything or do you, do you have them for reference and be able to yeah, go through things? I, we live and die by them because our, our, our goal, our aesthetic would be to record everything fresh for right. every film. Right. We never get but the budgets get as often as we'd like to do that. So you must rely on some kind of archived sound because you just can't capture it all. Wow. So we all take pride in our libraries and we're constantly building and growing them as technology sure. increases and improves. We're always getting better and better. So even though I may have captured a, you know, an analog sound on Inagra 20 years ago that mm -hmm. I loved, I might take the chance to do a 192K version of it if I come across the same thing again because I just want it sure. better sure. as time progresses. Fascinating. We were talking earlier today and um, I find this fascinating, uh, and by the way, adding some some real sounds into program sounds, which is what I get a lot of in my line of work, I think is absolutely imperative. I think 
the brain needs interesting things to process, and, it, and it's more comfortable processing from a position of something it already knows rather than right. the figuring out. Yeah, there's stuff. this metaphor yeah. thing that I work with a lot because you create attachments to sounds you recognize, yeah. and you can co-opt that and leverage it later. Plus, right. plus That's part of the creative process. Plus, right. plus creating a, an image in the listener's mind is always producing good results in the end. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I got to get this in or sure. I'll explode. <laughs> but that would be good for wow. the show. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm just giddy about that. No, no. We're going to come back to explosions later on okay. the show. Right. I love cool. explosions. I'll make the sound for but, you. Uh, but there's a scene where, where the, the, I think you call it the war wagon, just war rig. W or gets pierced by a spear. Right. And, and then when that gas exhales, you actually used a whale's right. blowhole oh, correct. as the sound for that. Right. Because... Well, I, wow. this is a bit esoteric, and we can debate this a little bit. That was a Barbara Walker. Yeah. That was like, a Barbara Walker. It was. I'm, I'm going to cry. I mean, I'm oh, my cry. gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do a lot of script analysis, and I look for metaphors sonically, dramatically, mm. and even um, from literature. And I saw the end of Mad Max as Moby Dick. Ah. Arguably, mm -hmm. a Morton Joe, the mm -hmm. antagonist, mm -hmm. is Ahab. And the war rig is the embodiment of the great white whale. No question. And they're chasing, you know, it's a chase across the ocean. And they, I forget, what's the, I can't forget the name of the ship from the, from the, the book. Oh, wow. And they're, I, I they're harpooning Ahab, the whale. Ahab and Herbert Manville. But right. Herman so um, I thought, well, what, here's one of many interesting ways to engage the audience, perhaps intellectually and literally, uh, by creating a sonic analogy, a mm -hmm. sonic metaphor. If... The harpoon, they are literally spearing it with harpoons, just like in a, in a whaling ship, mm -hmm. but it's piercing a, a tank instead of a whale. So not only did I use this um, uh, Moby Dick metaphor, uh, not only did we put blowholes uh, when the harpoon would pierce the truck, but I put whale groans as if a beast had been skewered, wow. as if it had been injured, because oh I wanted God. to personify so cool. the war rig as if it were a character. And that was a running theme throughout the movie, that the war rig, there was Furiosa, Mad Max, the wives, and the war rig, I considered it as another character. It occupies so much screen yes, time, indeed. I wanted to see it as... Um, Oh, that is brilliant, Mark. That is absolutely because you know what, what? It's humbling. It's amazing. Well, it is, and I think as a movie goer. Well, did anybody get it? I, I, well, you know what? <laughs> but, but, that, that we could argue that. Well, here I think there's a couple things. But it I makes think, me happy. Well, one, it makes you happy, yeah. and two, I think the notion that anything that you impugn and, and, and absorb works on several levels. So I might not have intellectually got it with the, with the front of my brain, but yeah. if I subconsciously am getting that, yeah. it is just right. making me enjoy this, and Great. I don't even have to Great. know why. Great. Yeah. That is, oh, You man. said it better than I could have, because <laughs> I'm constantly trying to work on that subconscious that level. flat out brilliant. I just think it's a better world knowing that Mark is in here doing that I, stuff. I, I'm I telling mean, you, man. I'm, the amount that he cares for us. Next week, the intro of the show is going to be completely different. <laughs> just, isn't that amazing? It's a lot of manipulation. It's right. a little devious, but that's that's this trade. We that's what we trade in in cinema. It, it, what, what's fascinating to me is 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 the category of what you do seen as technical or seen as creative? Because God knows it's creative. Well, there are many answers to that. For decades, it was seen as a technical trade or craft because so much of it requires exactly. technical know-how to operate the equipment. Sure. But really, it, is, it has been gravitating away from that, mm -hmm. and it has become a creative endeavor that filmmakers recognize as part of their storytelling toolbox, mm. and they turn to sound designers to help them tell their stories mm -hmm. with sound. It's not just... I'm missing the sound of an explosion, you just put, that put in, in an explosion. I don't care if it's from the library. Right, right. But now they're starting to recognize you can go so much further with mm -hmm. it. And you can have dramatic and intellectual and, and uh, narrative discussions about films with a sound designer and achieve great results. And has that arc, and I'm, I'm making a corollary to what we've been lucky enough to build here, have you seen that arc improve from the director's perspective, from the studio's perspective, that, sa that sound is important? It's a tool that can help sell things. It's a tool that can make the film better. Yes. So you see more attention, more. Yes. Because I, you, you always see it in the creative spaces. I know this happened with me when I had some moments on Broadway. You'll see it in budgets. Yeah. You'll see it in time. Yes. 
you'll see it in who you can hire and and the care yes. and respect for it and you're seeing that improve even though we are in what we call a mature industry the, yes. the, the cinema is sort of at a, at a plateau mm -hmm. perhaps mm -hmm. seeding some ground to VR and mm -hmm. things like that mm -hmm. And yet, um, in sound, where there's still a, a continued recognition for the sort of value added mm -hmm. that good sound brings. And as you know, and your audience probably knows, we s continue to see an escalation in the sophistication of theater reproduction systems oh, like Dolby Atmos and DTSX and yes. Oro and things like that. So the theater owners, the studios recognize that this is value added for their product mm -hmm. and they want to find any way possible to engage an audience and make that a, an experience they want to reproduce. A, they, they want the audience to reproduce. You, you brought up something. I'm sorry, man. I'm just uh, I'm I'm, so I'm, into this. You brought up something. My next question is going to bring everything to a halt. In okay, cool. So, all right. Well, <laughs> let me get a little deeper in before we do one of those questions. Uh, um, <laughs> the, you, you brought up something interesting that I, several months ago we went up, we were invited up to uh, Facebook and we met some of the lieutenants and there was a long, a fairly lengthy discussion with us about their commitment to VR yeah. and that audio was sound was so important to that sure. space. And if you've ever yeah. experienced virtual reality, it's one thing to put something on, but yeah. it's what happens in here yeah. that makes that experience. Do yeah. you play around in the VR space? Do you watch it? Do you? Um, I, I am trying to um, co-opt the VR um, experience mm -hmm. and, and use it in cinema, which is to say they figured out something that in cinema we haven't quite gotten to yet. We can recreate a VR-like experience mm -hmm. sonically in a movie theater, but we haven't figured out what the tools are yet and the methodologies are to actually create it. Right. So yeah. I've one of the many things I'm doing is I've built uh, an ambisonics microphone ah. and I've built a plug-in so that I can leverage what is now this isotropic sound field mm -hmm. and and put um, phase related audio into every one of those speakers and create an immersive experience that isn't just take a stereo recording and diverge it into 32 speakers right. I'm putting 32 channels of discrete audio to create an immersive Thir space 32 channels of audio yeah wow you can go more I struggle with two well, <laughs> I'm a 1.1 1. 1 king. <laughs> well, but, but remember the space that I'm trying to work in sometimes, which right. is on this subconscious level of if we can convince the our goal in cinema is to um, uh, suspend disbelief. Yes, it's absolutely. a critical uh, uh, concept in cinema. Absolutely, you're walking into a cinema and you're trying to convince an audience with that what they're about to see is real, absolutely. and nothing about it is real. That's exactly right. So if I can, on a subconscious level, move the audience a little closer to that place, one of the ways to do it is with immersive sound. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you're at, you know, you know, you've heard people say things like this when they do the VR experience. Oh my God, I feel like I'm really, I feel like I'm really there. Yes. I can recreate audio in that way mm -hmm. to help them just on, the, on a sonic level. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of the sort of subterfuge that we work in, in, in cinema sound. Be because I think the audience, um, I learned this from Maurice White when I worked with him for a little bit. He had spent a lot of time in the early years, uh, we, we used to call it church, and by the time you walked into wherever they were playing, your experiential process started the minute you went through the gate turnstile. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with sound and just the environment mm -hmm. and lighting and just, and what you would find, and I find the same thing in the movies, when I walk into a movie theater and sit down, I suspend certain kinds of things and I open myself up to just right. going on the journey. Right, there you go. And, and then, yeah. so then whatever you present me, I'm sort of open to and I can judge whether I'm going or not. When it's a really rich experience, it's two hours of just, right. thank God I got to shut down life and go learn or sure. experience something. Or, yeah. So it's always, you, you guys well, discussed I, I it. Well, I think now. audiences actually are pretty sophisticated, orally speaking. So I. Every one of us has had the experience of watching a film and hearing something, a bad line of dialogue, a bad piece of ADR, a yes. cheesy sound effect. Yes. And just for that brief moment, your, your subconscious says, I didn't buy that. Right. The more we can eliminate those mm -hmm. beats, mm -hmm. the less they accumulate, the more they engage in the story. Because when you have that interruption, you disconnect. And then you're out and, of the story. And you're out of the story. And either they win you back or they're gone. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's, a tough thing to, that's a tough thing to watch. Speaking of explosions, I love <laughs> explosions. I love Who explosions. Who doesn't? Right, absolutely. It's all American. I, 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 
would like to put more in my mix work, more explosions. Right. Um, I think that they're primal. I think that they just do a lot of cool stuff. Sure. How do I make explosions like in the movies? Because <laughs> <laughs> explosions in real life, I mean, I've seen, I've gone to Vegas just to watch the buildings come down. Sure. You know? I've recorded yeah. those. Have you really? Yeah, it, oh, I, I get mic microphones everywhere. I love that process. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, but when, when I see those kind of things in, on TV, the explosions are enhanced. And do you, yeah. do you sit there with like some plugins and, and just put that 30, 20, 30 cycles in there? Or how do, how, do you, how do you get an explosion to come out of the speakers in a theater? I think it's the same process you go through trying to get a great like kick or snare sound. Uh -huh. um, there's no one way to do it, uh -huh. but for me it always starts with a fresh ingredient. So we'll go out, we have, I am always out recording and I have contacts with the U.S. military mm. and de um, demolition experts and I'll first gather raw materials. I'll get an idea of what kind of explosion I want to eat. Here's What's a good that? example. This was from an explosion mm. shoot. This was with the U.S. Army bomb disposal oh, unit. Wow. And this is us sort of unpacking the gear and Very prepping cool. our, our rigs. We eventually moved this out into a valley where we detonated undetonated ordnance. Oh, really? And so um, we cool. will so always capture... Can you call me next time you do that? It's so much fun, let me tell you. Oh it is God, so much go. fun. Yeah. And so we will place an array of microphones, because we never know those sound pressure levels exactly, so yeah. we will put out an array of microphones from ribbons mm. to cardioids mm. to mm. dynamics to contacts. Wow. You name it. Uh, I would think you'd use 421s or something. We, we, we bring out 421s always as part of the kit, uh -huh. and we will multi-mic for microphone type as well as for um, immersion. Mm. If, we, if we can capture something like there's my holophone, the H1 there, that's an eight-channel oh, yeah. mic. Right. I mean, that's the DPA. Wow. We got Sennheisers in the shotguns. We have everything under the sun. Um, is that real animal fur? <laughs> No okay. animals Just were hurt in the, the making of these of explosion sound. recordings. <laughs> so it starts with these raw recordings, mm -hmm. getting big ordnance and recording them in the right environment. The mm -hmm. right to, so here's the, the, the worst mistake you can make with anything loud. Don't do it in the desert. The first instinct is to go to a quiet place, mm. but what you need is a re reflections. Yeah. You need a, a, an acoustic yeah. environment that's going to throw some of it back that at you. Sense. Deserts yeah. are the worst it place to do gunshots. But you can't add that environment it's not as good as the real thing. It's oh. never as good. It's oh. never as rich and as real. And here's that subconscious thing we talked about a little uh -huh. bit earlier yeah. of suspension of disbelief. The brain will trigger on a sound that was recorded acoustically quicker than it will with something you, if you added a digital reverb. Never as good. So now you've got your raw elements. Now you go back into the studio and you want to play. And you start finding the textures that you like. You know, I like the 421, but it's missing the snap of the capsule collapse of my Sheps. Mm. So I'm gonna mix a little of the Sheps with a little bit of the 421, but you know what? My, uh, my Sankin got that deep, I got that, you know, pressure, what do you call that one with the, the plate? What do you call it, a pressure zone, PZM. Yeah. Mm. So the you PZM, still PZMs? We, we use PZM, we put everything out. We do 32 channels, and then I, you think, okay, I like the bottom that the PZM got. Okay, I'm gonna mix those three together. Okay, good, but the envelope is still not right because it doesn't sound like a classic explosion. Because the cla a real explosion is like snap, poof, done. Yeah, I like but, classic. But but movie sound is like yeah. with that right. long tail. Yeah. Right. So now you got to bring in your compressors and your limiters mm. and start knocking down that first transient a little bit, mm -hmm. and then bringing up the tail, which gives you the girth, gives mm -hmm. you the, the meat of the explosion. You, you're and like so, a real mix engineer. That's cool. Uh, I am a real so, mix yeah, engineer. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, like, where, like, where did we go like, wrong there, Dave? Like an Oscar winning <laughs> real mix engineer. I knew I'd get it. I knew I'd get it. He's real the... sensitive about the creative stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just sort of poke me. Don't you? Right, he's, he's good for Do that. Do you ever use that uh, Waves plugin, Low Air? It was designed for um, explosions. I, I prefer one called Low Ender from, not Zynaptic, um, it's just, it's one I prefer. There's three uh, or four good ones. But you do use Low a plug Air in, huh? does, I like Low Ender because it, it synthesizes a deeper, free, I can get some real like down to 25 cycles stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, thank you, that's the final component. Once you get it without the subwoofer, because that's mm -hmm. cheating, right. you want a really meaty, you know, juicy, yeah. mm -hmm. enjoyable explosion all on its own. Mm -hmm. Once you get it the way you like it, 
Then you start bringing in the, what, the what, LFE return. What is your monitoring environment at home to be able to do? I mean, are you doing some of these at home and some of them? No, no I have a stu I have a re I have a 7.1 mixing room. That's my studio. I have a what a monitors screen. are you using to, for explosions? JBLs for explosions. I I, I, I live JBLs. on one set of monitors only mm. because um, I have are to. Are you using those tall ones with the? They're three ways, um, the triamped. Mm. Um, but and remember, I have a screen. There's, I have a movie screen, a perforated screen, three speakers right. behind the screen, um, a mixing console, right. uh, uh, seven point one surround sound, and a, and a subwoofer. And I have to live and die by the reproducibility of that environment mm -hmm. everywhere I go in the world. That's so I, cool. I monitor to a to the X curve. And nothing else, and that never changed. That's an EQ mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and, a, and an SPL setting mm -hmm. that I can't deviate from. And well, I never. Well, what do. would be different about your monitoring as opposed to mine, apart from the the number speakers? Because I never touch the monitor knob. That's the first uh, difference. You mean volume? Yeah, that uh, never moves. That's 85 uh, SPLC weighted, and I'm on the X curve, 4 dB, 6 dB per octave, starting at 4.5 k. Wow. That's a standardized, globally accepted monitoring environment for cinema Is that, that right? no one deviates from. Oh, and so you right. always, that's, that's interesting. So I don't have to think about it. Right. That I, way I know, when I mix in my studio, which is a design sure. edit room, I know when I bring it to Warner Brothers, where I mix a lot, mm -hmm. in their big mix room with the mm -hmm. director, right. it's going to translate. Absolutely. EQ and level and, every, and, and separation. Now, your spot, is that Formosa? Yeah, that's your spot. the gotcha. Formosa group in Hollywood. Gotcha. So you've been, you've been doing that for a while. That's, yeah. that's the shop that Four does. Four years, yeah, great group of people. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. That, that is really phenomenal. What's, what's is, I, I, I kind of fascinated by some of the, Old movie stuff like the Sprocket days. Do you miss the Sprocket <laughs> days? In the uh, movie no. all day? Explain, explain to our audience the the, the, the Do I need the to look problems. at the camera when I do this? Uh, no. Well, <laughs> you, you need some, you need some <laughs> tissue, <laughs> tissue for that. Well, back in the old days. <laughs> like the movie all the Sprocket days just got to be so much more fun now, right? Well, believe it or not, in the earlier days of film sound, all sound for film was. Recorded, recorded and edited on sprocketed film, just like the, the image was. Yeah. You know, we all know what a roll of film yep. looked like with sprockets yep. down yep. the side and frames. Mm -hmm. Right. The, in sound, we had that same film stock, but with magnetic oxide glued to stripes down the middle of it. Wow. And you would, but it was huge. It was like the bandwidth was crazy. Right. Incredible headroom on this stuff. And that's what you would record your audio to either as your source elements or your masters. Right. Your master might be this wide, 35 millimeters wide, and it would be edge to edge uh, oxide, and you could divide that into two, three, four, or eight channels wow. of audio, like a multi-track. Wow. And but that, we're, we're, you had to edit on these sewing machine, like steam-powered machines called oh, moviolas, that clattered, and you couldn't, you had to wear head, like aircraft, you know, aircraft carrier grade headphones. Are, are you saying that the, I thought the 35 millimeter the, where the sprockets were was where the sound was. The center part, I thought, was the film, was the, was the picture itself. On release itself. prints, but not in, in, not in post-production. The actual working with the sound, the, the source audio, the edited sounds, and the mastering of it happens on film with no image on it, but with oxide uh, glued to it. Correct me if I do this wrong, because some people in our audience probably don't know what a sprocket is or 35 millimeter <laughs> film, but the film came in a strip. And, and, and the same 35 millimeter film that they used in movies, they used in SLR cameras. Correct. And the sides of the film, the edges of the film, were perforated with little holes. Right. And there was a there was a wheel that had little teeth on it, and it would grab those holes and move the film along. Correct. And so that's what we're talking about, the sprockets. Right. Is, is yeah. that okay? That, that's exactly it. And, and, and the, um, the, the, the joke that everyone would love to play on, on an apprentice uh, or a PA was to send them out for a cup of sprocket holes. Hey, <laughs> 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 internship in Salas Place next week. You got you something. Learn here. Don't let them pull it on you. Exactly. <laughs> Chuck, where you got a, you got a couple stuff. questions? We got some really good ones. All right, what's your from Tony Ramos. What sounds do you usually spend the most time on, and what's your typical miking setup for a car? Those are two hugely no, complex. I know, right. <laughs> God, how do you answer those? The, the, the first one is quite simple. The hardest thing to create, design, 
are creature voices, mm. speaking characters that uh, you know have some kind of alien, monsterish sure. qualities to them. Mm. The, the reason for that is that the human ear has uh, has a propensity to want to listen in a certain way and either agree this is human or not human mm. and detects falsity, fakeness right away. quickly. Wow! It's the hardest thing to do, and because the the client, the filmmaker, will always want to try to explore the boundaries between sounds too much like a creature make it sound more human mm. sounds too human mm. it doesn't sound enough like the creature mm. and you're always those are the 14th iterations of of something that i'm talking before. about the avatar creatures as you said yeah. yeah 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 gotcha. so th those are the hardest things to do and, well, so the, oh sorry well no the, the second part of the question was and the second part was my miking setup for an automobile right. that that's a real art form mm. but in its simplest form and every vehicle is different especially if it's electric or diesel or uh, gas, but will be something like this: a quad array in the cab, mm -hmm. in in the in the inside the car, mm -hmm. um, so that you get an immersive thing that you can play left, right, left, right, surround. Mm -hmm. um, dual mics on the the exhaust, but set back from the exhaust because mm -hmm. you can't be in the blast zone of the exhaust. You have to be set back from it oh, with really? a dynamic microphone because that's where the excitement comes from. Ooh. All the excitement in an engine is at the exhaust pipe not in the engine compartment. The engine compartment, you always place a mic in there. There's some interesting th things there, but it's mostly tap it clatter and right. whirring mechanical noises that we don't associate with an automobile. Mm -hmm. Then we'll put usually a left and a right in the front or rear wheel, wheel well so you get that sense of motion right, and spinning. Right, 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 right. And then we might put a mic with a window crack so you get the sound of wind kind of flowing by. So it's usually like an eight to nine channel Marcus mic Martin. setup. Mark, 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 Mark. This is all kind of cool and a little oh, bit no. hypocritical. Have I gone over? No, no. You know, it's, you know I'm, 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 uh, I don't know how to don't express this to man. the audience. So, the MGM lion. Uh-oh. Oh, it was the don't, same don't, lion, don't. Leo, for 50 years. Yeah. And somebody comes along named Mark Mangini and redoes the sound of the lion. You know where he uses her? No, I don't. Well, he's Mr. Honest. You'd think a lion's not. It's a tiger, Mark. How, why would you use a tiger roar for the iconic MGM lion? Don't lie. You know you did. You know you did. Wow. I'll, let, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> okay. um, for 60 years, it was just the MGM line and nobody questioned it right. <laughs> until 1981 when I worked on a film called Poltergeist, sure. a Steven Spielberg, Amazing. Tony Hooper film. Amazing movie. MGM film. And we thought we had endeavored to make this as high fidelity a movie as we possibly could. Mm -hmm. Really stretch it, oh, pushing the Oh, there's the poor little guy now. Yeah. So, um, but then MGM sent me the stock audio for the logo. Uh-huh. And, we li and it's, it was an optical recording. It was made uh, not uh, even with magnetic media. And we thought, this is really tatty. It's an awful way to open our film. Right, right. So I asked Spielberg's permission to redo the, the MGM line. He said, go ahead and do it. So I started research. I started listening and finding the elements until I discovered that it was, in fact, not a line. I listened to I did a lot of field recordings, as you saw here. And um, <laughs> I remade it. defensive now, her. It, no, it, but it, well, it wasn't. A I don't want to burst to people's with. bubble. Right, but, right, right. Uh, we had the opportunity to rectify that. So I did a, a great deal of, of field recording, and once I started to record lions and tigers, I began to realize I recognize those sounds. Mm. I know what they are. Mm. Just some anonymous sound editor in a dark, dank editing editing room in 1937 at MGM just put in these because they're more ferocious sounding because in fact when a lion roars what mm -hmm. you discover quickly is a lion's roar sounds like a yawn right right when they do this big it's, it's like right, right and it sounds it's not very <laughs> it's frightening. similar to a yawn it's a similar thing yeah but then right. when a tiger lets <laughs> loose it's this i mean it's feral right and it's it, it's it's and it's primitive and even even though i'm standing with four inches of steel between us, I yeah, got like, a primitive, like, Cro-Magnon man reaction, sure. like, fuck, oh run! God, right, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It just, you know, it just can't happen. Yeah, it makes sense to me. <laughs> Sorry and, to hijack your question. And, no, 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 no. <laughs> and, and tigers are known for their voiceovers. So yeah, even that's it, true. You know, so it, it can make it happen. Did you have another one there? I did. All right, go ahead. This is from Matt O'Hara. What are some general guidelines for finding sounds that glue into a film, and how long did it take in your career until you made sounds that actually felt real? Oh, God. That's, that's broad. 
that is really broad. I'm not even sure a glue into interpret glue into a film. And I'll, I'll I think in I'm some ways he's an, no. I think in some ways you've answered that. Yeah. Like the, your approach to it, and how certain things you know what you want to create, and it's in your subconscious I, that becomes real. And I have a, a first response, and mm -hmm. that is this. Again, we talked about suspension of disbelief. Yes. Um, one of the, 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 the starting points, the foundation of a good soundtrack in a film is to build something that sounds real. Mm -hmm. So, a stew can sound. Everyone, I think, has, even the, a, a non-sound person has a sort of a sixth sense about they hear something that doesn't sound good right. or it's canned. Right. And so, the first step, just like a chef would do, mm -hmm. no self-respecting chef would serve a meal at a fine restaurant from canned food. Right, no question. They would buy the freshest ingredients at the market that yes, day. Absolutely. So too should we go out and capture as much purpose-built, original sound as possible mm -hmm. that serves the film. Mm -hmm. If the film takes place at a, um, uh, pick, pick a movie, mm -hmm. uh, go record the sounds from that location, mm -hmm. and th th those will all automatically have some honesty in the scene that you don't have to worry about. Wow. So there's sticking, is that, was that, yeah. does that kind of answer yeah. that first no, question? No, it does. It does. One so. caveat, though. Uh, Chef Boyer D. Ravioli in a can is an exception. Nothing tastes as good as Chef Boyer Well, we all Boyer have our guilty Ravioli pleasures. I, I, I Cold or hot. And, and you know, it's if I, and then so to be the devil's advocate to the devil's advocate, uh -huh. um, I will use canned sound if I think it works and it tells the story. I, I won't pick a gunshot because I recorded it at 192K mm -hmm. if the one I think that was recorded on optical media mm -hmm. 60 years ago is better for a certain there reason. You know. I'm not arrogant about it. Mm -hmm. It's just what serves. It just what serves, serves the project. Yeah, absolutely, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's. All right, man, humbly, listen, humbly. You, you got your batter's box thing up? Because I do. our guy's over hitting. Can I ask one quick question? You can ask two. Do you ever, uh, are you familiar with the McGurk effect? <laughs> I am not. Well, the McGurk <coughs> effect. Is that the, the gorilla in the basketball no, court? No, the bar, fine. And <coughs> it's, 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 it's proof that, that vision takes precedent over hearing in yes, the brain. Yes, I've heard of this. Do you ever, do you ever consciously <coughs> fight that in order to get somebody to see what they hear? That's or is it, or is it, a, or is it just innate and intuitive to you already at this time? Because sometimes the vision that you're seeing on the screen is so strong, mm -hmm. it'll color and affect what you're hearing. Is what the McGurk effect says. Ah. So do you ever, do you ever take that into account, even on a subconscious level? You can say pass if you want. I don't know if this question is any good or not. I, I don't have an immediate answer to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it later, okay? Okay. Uh, I yeah. love no, what no, no, actually, even better. Let's talk about when we have him back again, because we're going to oh, have okay. him back. <laughs> All right, tee up your arm, batter's box. Okay. we got a guy. He's got bat speed, and, and, and he runs a Who's pass pitching and who's fast. batting? He's, he's pitching. pitching? You're, you're batting. Okay. And we have moved all the outfielders out of the field because the yeah. balls are going to go over the yeah. fence. So yeah, yeah. I'm swinging little, for the fences. Okay, so. I need a little tiny setup because this one's different. Okay. I, I, I went through and I chose different occupations in the world of cinema. I love the word cinema as okay. opposed to movies and films. Okay. I'm just the sound of it is okay. so yeah. gorgeous. And, uh, yeah. So I've chosen 10 um, positions and responsibilities and jobs within the audio part of making movies, okay. and, and, and so I'm going to toss a name out, and you tell me Come on. a quick description of what of words, they want. a couple of right? Yeah. All right. Production sound mixer. Sound recorded on set. Ah. Boom operator. The person who holds the microphone on set. How? Supervising sound editor. The person responsible for all the sound you hear in a movie. How? He hasn't heard these before. Okay. Sound designer. Sound designer is the same as a supervising sound editor, but usually a little more creative. Well, he's talking about himself. Wow. Dialogue editor. <laughs> Did I just shower myself with blushes? But, but it was beautiful. Beautiful the way you That's did it. That's called a curveball. That was. It was. That was fair. That was good. This would be a box. So it's time out. I'm coming to the plate. And now I'm back. I'm stepping out of the box. Exactly. Right. Dialogue right. editor. Uh, the person who assembles the sound recorded on the set. And my favorite, I have no clue, re-recording mixer. The... The film equivalent of an um, engineer mm. in, in the music studio. Okay, mm. music supervisor. The person responsible for the quality and uh, the quality of the music that you hear in the soundtrack. Mm. Composer. The person who writes the music for the film. Foley artist. The person who records. Excuse me. The person who performs the incidental sound effects for a movie. Pin drop. 
Two of them. What's a pen? <laughs> what does that mean? That just means you killed it. What that's that what it means. That was this a, is what I do every day. <laughs> How could I not know these Man. things? Fascinating. To that's me. the fastest reply. Look, guys, let me, just, let, me, let me just say this to our audience. One is you've just been taught um, wow. the most succinct way that a space, you know, we are always proponents of the fact that audio is this very large space. And it's applicable in so many professions, yeah. military, the police, forensics, medicine, it's all over yeah. the place. And more and more... I did a project for DARPA, speaking did of you military. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I'd love to talk about yeah. that. Um, one of the things that we are really pleased about is that we have a growing number of people in the film space yeah. who recognize mm -hmm. that we care about audio. We've had, yeah. a few, we've had some of these folks on the show. And it's always a place where there's a cutting edge process to, that is pushing the envelope always in sound. There's mm -hmm. this sort of quest mm -hmm. that is never answered, so it's always pushing forward. And I just encourage folks to make sure that, look, mix records, mix music, but learn mixing and realize that your world is mm -hmm. really, really broad, right? Yeah. Don't you think? Uh, one of the, when, when people, when students ask me, oh, you know, what should I be doing? How do I learn my craft? The first thing I tell them is, go listen to the world. Yes. And then go record it. Yes. Make a habit of it oh, every great. day. That is great. Because we, we often use the line, there's no place in the world that's silent. There you go. You know, <laughs> it's, it's sort of the same point. Um, we go around and speak to folks all the time. I think, you know, if ever your schedule permitted, we'd love to have you on a couple of those things. Because okay. this is just manna from heaven. I mean, look, you and I are like little kids. Oh, like, I was enamored at Gear Expo. I mean, I was like, man, we got to talk to him again. Yeah, no, got, no, got, no. Got, so got kind. He's, a, he's, a, he's a, and this is the highest compliment I can pay him. He's one of us. Oh, and, ah, absolutely one of us. Brothers. Absolutely. And, I don't know what us is, but you ain't them. All right, right. much more of us. We'll take on this side. Uh, so, you know, we won't stalk you, but we'll be calling you. Yeah. You don't mind? <laughs> no. Oh, good. No. We, we, Anytime I can spread the good word yeah, we, of audio, oh, I'm, man. What, I'm happy to do that. What a great hour. Dave, you want to take right. us home? Or you want I to give do. us home? Well, a little of both. Um, Herb and I normally close at this point, but can you give me like two or three um, applications of your philosophy that you think would work in my world because you probably are way more aware of my world than I am yours so one mm -hmm. or two suggestions that might help me in my world okay um, the f to, for me creativity is at the pinnacle of what I'm trying to achieve mm -hmm. and get in touch with mm -hmm. so I am gradually learning how to get in touch with my creative side as best as I can before I try to attack anything in what I do. Mm. So I think you need to, we need to, I need to learn and develop exercises for getting in touch with our intuitive side, mm. our emotional space, mm -hmm. our creative space. And it's not easy to do in that hectic, you know, um, Boy, you know, the, the environment of the studio and you're under pressure, you need to turn out good work, but you have to create, turn out creative work. So the only way to do that is to get in touch with your creative mm -hmm. side and get in touch with your intuitive side. So I do actor's exercises. Mm -hmm. And I've taken acting lessons and I've taken improv comedy mm -hmm. classes so that I can get in touch with that. And mm -hmm. so one of my exercises is when I have a creative block, what I, what I know is that I'm disattached from my emotional side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have to cry. Mm -hmm. So I try to play music read stories, I try to do whatever I can to get that myself into an em unblocked. The minute that emotional reaction oh happens, God. even if it's giddy elation or happiness, mm -hmm. but usually for me, crying works the best. The minute the crying response comes, the idea comes. Wow. It's because the good idea doesn't come from being in that stuck in your head space. It comes from being in touch with that much deeper space. Before we say goodbye, how many times have you heard that conversation with me and Charlie? I've heard a good amount of times. I, I, really? I, well, I'm an emotional guy, okay. and so my team will tell you that different things will trigger stuff in me, and I almost can't control it, but I've always learned, and I just didn't ever articulate it, that that's actually the gateway. You probably do it instinctually without having an intellectual Yeah, and, like and, I and, and I know that the gateway, though, is a place that is a really good place for me to then be creative, yeah. because you have to allow yourself to be touched. Yeah. And when yeah. you allow yourself to be touched, yeah. it comes out, and that is really particularly hard for men. Because exactly. men are conditioned differently. Exactly right. and, and, exactly and every right. creative person I know who's super creative finds a way to get to that space. So right. I, I, I live it and share right. it. 
Right. I, this show could go on for about two or three hours. I am telling I'm, you, I'm say, say goodbye because it'll never <laughs> end. Just, just wait. Yeah. I have more answers. <laughs> One of my all-time favorite shows. I learned so much. Hope you do too. See you next time. Thank Watch you. this. Bye, guys. Thank you.